Colorado's emergency response leader threatened and berated co-workers so badly he got suspended. Now the Polis administration is defending him while keeping the governor protected from our questions. There's a reason we don't count ballots by hand anymore. It's just very labor intensive. Um, hand counting is not accurate. Yet Republicans who lost their primaries by a country mile want those hand recounts. When you call for help, the person on the other end may be answering from home. A candidate to lead Colorado says there will be no more questions about a topic where he's been caught not telling the truth. And the truth is, we could use something to celebrate after all that. Just that I'm here is good news. <laughs> There's more where that came from, because it's Friday, and this is next. The administration is circling the wagons to defend the state's emergency management chief. A man who was suspended for unprofessional and threatening behavior toward co-workers. Mike Willis was punished for violating Colorado's workplace violence prevention and response policy. And now Willis is being defended at multiple levels of the Polis administration. But the governor himself will not answer our questions. Colorado's emergency management chief Mike Willis was berating a female co-worker so loudly that a warehouse camera caught other people looking in the direction of the noise. The woman said that incident came closer to becoming physical than anything she ever experienced while working for the Department of Corrections. An internal report shows Willis was suspended for a pattern of inappropriate behavior that must be corrected. Willis's history of abusive, threatening behavior, first reported by the Denver Post, was outlined in a workplace violence, conduct, and ethics complaint, where Colorado's Director of Safety, Stan Hilke, said Willis's behavior put the state at legal risk. Hilke is now part of a parade of Polis administration officials defending Willis, telling us, quote, he has worked to change his workplace demeanor. Willis's boss, Kevin Klein, director of the Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Management, blamed their dynamic, high-pressure, high-impact, time-sensitive environment. The Polis administration even offered us an unsolicited endorsement of Willis from a fellow National Guard leader, Army Brigadier General Laura Clellan, who said she had total trust and confidence in his ability. Willis himself issued a statement saying he takes responsibility for quote-unquote missteps and that he has been held accountable. We asked Democratic Governor Jared Polis' office when the governor became aware of his emergency management chief's history of abusive behavior and what the governor planned to do about it now. The governor would not talk about that. We were instead given a statement from the governor's chief of staff saying that they trust their agency leaders to handle personnel issues. So Colorado's most famous election denier, Tina Peters, is going to blow a quarter million dollars on a recount that Peters is just going to say is rigged because it's being done by machines. Three other Colorado Republicans who also got trounced in their primaries are paying for similar recounts. They all want them done by hand. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger explains why Republican and Democratic election officials alike say that's dumb. Poll us for governor. This is what it looks like to count an election by hand. When Denver Elections tested its equipment with 64 ballots before the June 28th primary, they did a hand recount after the machine count, which took an hour longer for 64 ballots. It's easy to make a mistake. It's easy to get lost in which line you're on. Pam Feely was an election judge in May for West Metro Fire's election of four board members, an election that was conducted by hand, kind of like this. The next ballot, it's candidate... A, it took us three hours to count less than 500 ballots. Hand counting is not accurate. Typically, you see uh, a 2% inaccuracy race, uh, rate, and also hand counts uh, lend themselves to shenanigans. Starting tomorrow, Republican El Paso County Clerk Chuck Browerman will do two machine recounts of local elections. Two losing candidates paid the county $20,000 for recounts. Peter Lupia finished second in the Republican primary for El Paso County Clerk with just 36% of the vote. He lost by 27,000 votes and paid for a recount. Rayanne Weber was second in the Republican primary for coroner with 34%. She lost by 30,000 votes and paid for a recount. These candidates are asking for a hand count, which is not permissible by, by state statute. So as much as they wish they would like to do a hand count, it just won't, will not happen in this election. Most people don't add 
or subtracting their checkbook, they use a calculator or they use their phone. We're not, we're not hand counting our daily money. Let's not forget, we've previously reported that Republican Elbert County Clerk Dallas Schroeder did a hand count after the 2020 election and confirmed the machine count was more accurate. Even after this, Schroeder admitted to making copies of his election machine hard drive. There will be probably nothing that will ever truly satisfy some of these conspiracy theorists on the conduct of elections. There is a third recount happening in El Paso County with a state Senate candidate. She also lost with 34 percent. She sent a deposit to the Secretary of State's office for that recount. All of these recounts need to be done by Thursday. Yeah. And if there is even one vote difference, it is likely because someone scribbled on one dot and then made an adjustment and it gets scrutinized a bit closer on a recount than it did on election night where you still had two people looking at it to decide what the voter intent was. That's likely where any change would happen. It's not unheard of for a couple of votes to change here or there when we have those mandatory recounts when races are, are really, really close. Uh, I heard from Chuck Rowerman. He said that there was a group of county clerks that talked at a conference and could not remember in the last 26 years of any election that flipped because of a mandatory recount. Even the close ones have never flipped. The he closest could... that require the recount. They couldn't remember when the race went, oh, we thought this candidate won, yeah. but it was really this one. And that's when it, you have to recount. And so Tina Peters just needs 88,000 votes. 88,570 to be safe, I think. So you're saying there's a chance. Marshall, thank you. The Republican nominee for lieutenant governor says he will not be answering any more questions about his election rigging conspiracy theories. In actuality, Danny Moore has been sheltered from all reporter questions since he joined Heidi Ganahl's ticket. Now, in a column written for a conservative newspaper, Moore falsely claims that he was never an election denier and says there will be no more question about it. Moore wrote in the Colorado Springs Gazette, quote, I believe and have always believed that Joe Biden was legitimately elected president and that he is our commander in chief. That calls into question whether Moore knows that the Internet exists because the Colorado Springs Gazette itself reported on Moore's social media posts that Biden was, quote, elected by the Democrat steal. I mean, the Gazette has the receipts at the newspaper. We have them, too. Moore said it was a Democratic steal. He also wrote that no one believes that 80 million people voted for Joe Biden. He said that mail-in ballots can be controlled by ballot counters and postal workers. Moore said in the column that all future questions about his election denialism will be referred back to the column, the one where he falsely claims he never said those things. The town of Superior's new gun laws, which ban so-called assault rifles, have been placed on hold until at least early November. Last week, the gun rights group Rocky Mountain Gun Owners filed a lawsuit saying that Superior's gun restrictions are unconstitutional. A judge granted a temporary restraining order which blocks those limits. A preliminary injunction will be heard in early November, which means the gun law is on hold until then. If your phone went nuts this afternoon, is probably this landspout tornado, which was spotted in Aurora near Buckley Space Force Base. This is around 4.30 today, near 225 in Colfax. It was, it was more of a dusting uh, than anything else, but the storm did have some real potential. And meteorologist Lauren Robinson, you're keeping an eye on some others that also have potential tonight. That's right. We are continuing to monitor scattered storms across the area. And what happened earlier and what we are going to keep an eye out for through the rest of the evening is just a lot of energy kind of combining into one area. So when we had that tornado warning earlier, we had storms pushing in from the west. We had some coming in from the north. And we even had an outflow boundary pushing some energy in from the east. And it all just kind of combined right over Aurora. So this is where our tornado warning was. And you can see it really just quickly dissipated after that. We did uh, have a report from National weather service about that land spout, but nothing real severe happened there. Through the rest of the evening, though, we are going to continue to watch for the potential for all of that energy to really combine into one spot. So we're seeing that happen right now between Denver and Colorado Springs. So that's something we're going to keep an eye out for. Through the rest of the evening, though, any other storms, the biggest threat is going to be locally heavy downpours. So we do still have flood watches in effect for southeast and southwest Colorado until 10 o'clock this evening, as well as a flash flood watch over the Grizzly Creek burn area until 9 o'clock 
o'clock this evening. As we go into the overnight hours, though, everything starts to move out, including cloud cover. So we get a sunny start to our Saturday. More monsoonal moisture wraps in midday, but it looks like the majority of it stays in the high country and off into the western slope and really dying out by time it makes its way into the front range in eastern plains. Overnight, we cool down into the upper 50s and low 60s. Tomorrow, warmer weather moves back in in the upper 80s, and then we see even warmer weather midweek as we get to the mid 90s by Tuesday. Thank you, Lauren. There will be new trees planted in Denver's neighborhoods that need shade and some new job opportunities in urban forestry for Coloradans who have barriers to employment, both because of you, because you're awesome. Your latest word of thanks microgiving campaign has raised $12,000 in a couple of days for the park people. It's a nonprofit that's planted tens of thousands of trees in the city. They're also starting a new pre-apprenticeship program, hoping to solve Denver's shortage of urban foresters. People with problems finding work, like a criminal history or homelessness, can train on how to take care of our trees. They're needed in the field right now. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 if you want to get in on this goodness and join a whole bunch of us who are helping the park people bring trees to low-income neighborhoods and jobs to Coloradans who really want to work. Go for help in a mental health crisis and you may get patched through to someone else's house. We haven't shared much COVID news lately. We are seeing some positive trends. So let's talk about it. And this week, we share good news dating back generations. The good news is like when the war was over, that was good news. Yeah, yeah, I guess it was. It's good news, good perspective. Next. When you call Colorado Crisis Services, there is a good chance that the person answering that call is at home. You shouldn't be able to tell a difference. It's a change that they made out of necessity. Our new Roy takes a look at work from home during an emergency. For more than 25 years. I remember when we had, you know, the little beepers. Bev Marquez worked in crisis services the traditional way, together, in a center, in person. I started with a bias. A bias about permanent work from home for such sensitive work. But then the pandemic hit. The need for mental health help skyrocketed, well, and it was so point? hard to find enough staff. So Rocky Mountain Crisis Services has gone remote. 70 percent of our workforce now, there are 193 of us that are working remote and I won't be surprised if that feels a little uncomfortable. It's why Bev, the CEO, is sharing how this works. Employees send in pictures of HIPAA compliant workspaces. They're using noise canceling headsets, set up an office where others can't hear their conversations or see their computer screens and have good internet. If they can't meet those requirements, they have the option to work in person. Seems to be working well for our quality, for our retention. They are expecting more people to call after the national 988 line was launched. Other states are also recruiting for their own teams here in Colorado. So crisis services needed to hire from across the state. Didn't want to move into Denver, didn't, didn't need to be in Denver, couldn't afford to live in Denver. 911 is a very difficult job to do remote. Denver's dispatch center became creative out of necessity. They are so short staffed, some people are put on hold when they call 911, and not every position can be worked from home. This was an experiment, and we told them that from the beginning. But they found a way to make it work for people answering the non-emergency line. That makes up more than half of all of their calls. Eight calls on a separate phone system uh, document that information. It increases the chance that a 911 call taker will be ready and available when that next emergency call comes in. They won't already be on a non-emergency call. The second thing it does is it has helped to reduce burnout. So Denver 911 is really trusting their remote workers to set up their offices in the appropriate way. They're, of course, monitoring things from their end as well. Of course, it's not alleviating all of the problems. Here in Denver, you can still find yourself on hold when calling 911 anywhere from 30 seconds to a couple of minutes. They said you need to stay on the line because if you hang up, you actually end at the back of the queue. So it's better to just stay on the line. And of course, Kyle, they are working on hiring more people. They're trying to double their capacity for training this fall because that part you can't do from home. And so they just need more people in the office. And I'm sure like in any industry, some people want to work from home, but like this is pretty taxing work to be doing like 
by yourself at home, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things I've been wondering about all day. And when I asked Bev, she said they actually surveyed their current staff, and a lot of them said, we don't want to come back to the office. But that means you have to really make sure you're taking care of your team, because like you said, it's such intense work. A lot of that is going to be on supervisors checking in. They're going to be watching if somebody calls out sick repeatedly, check in on them, things like that to make sure that they're taken care of. Anusha Roy, thank you. If this story has you thinking that you might want to reach out for help for yourself or somebody in your life, know that Colorado Crisis Services and 988 are available at any hour of the day. Call 1-844-493-8255 or text the word TALK to 38255. Colorado's finally seeing an easing in this latest COVID wave. The more contagious but less serious Omicron variant has really pushed up our case counts and our positivity rate since early April. 10.2% of official tests have come back positive over the last week. That's actually the lowest positivity rate in more than two months. Pos positivity in cases started going up in early April. We've kind of been in this high plateau since late May. We're seeing signs, though, that it may be slowing. Case counts are down. About two weeks ago, we were averaging 2,000 new cases a day. Now it's 1,400. Haven't been that low since mid-May. Hospitalizations haven't really bumped up during this latest wave. They've been at about 300 patients for about a month and a half. And you got to bear in mind, especially with Omicron, it could be a lot of people hospitalized for something other than COVID who just happen to have the virus. It's Friday, so you know what's up around here. Oh, heaven, yes. Yeah, no, I'm all for good news. She's ready. Hope you are, too. We will never let you leave here discouraged on a Friday. That's next. So this little newscast turns six years old next week. Would you believe that? Six. One thing that has not changed since the very start is that we always set aside time on Friday for you to tell us what's good in your life. A sixth birthday seems like a blink to somebody who's had 105 birthdays. Whole lifetime of good news. She shared it with our Tom Cole. My name is Betty Lorraine. I was Betty Lorraine White. Now I'm Betty Lorraine Garrett. I was born on July 29th, 1917. I'm 105 years old today. At 105 years old, do you have any good news you could share with us? Yes, I'm very happy to be here. And I, I'm happy to be 105 and be as healthy as I am. So 105, how did you get here? You mean health-wise? Yeah, how did you get to, I mean, that's amazing. Oh, well, get out and move. I played tennis, I skied. And I, I attribute a lot of that to why I'm, nobody in my family lived to be in their 90s. What was good news when you were little? I worked at school and made $7 a month, and that was my money for a car fare and movies and a lot of things. I could make, I had a pattern that I could make dresses for three yards, and I could buy material for 15 cents a yard. So for 45 cents, I could have a new dress. <laughs> That's good news. <laughs> that was good news. When the war was over, that was good news. I met my husband after the war, and he was a great guy. I think maybe, I was always going to count up. I couldn't have had more than 20 days with him. <laughs> <laughs> you have 105 years of good news. Yeah. My one grandson that's 32, he and his wife just, they had a baby about four months ago. That was great. That yeah, was really good news. Is there any other good news or anything else you want to say? Just that I'm here is good news. <laughs> a sweet conversation with Tom Cole, who is the man who almost always brings us our good news segment every Friday. We have a sign for you. The dad jokes are alive and well. That plus your feedback next. It's a sign that's super corny, but you know what? In a way that can't help but make you smile. Paul Buster spotted it outside the Longmont Children, Youth, and Family Center. I used to be addicted to the hokey pokey. Then I turned myself around. See you groan. But then you kind of smile. If you see a sign and can't resist, email next at 9news.com or give us a shout with the hashtag HeyNext. Bill writes in to say kudos to Marshall Zellinger for his story on hand recounts. Bill says all voting systems have error rates. Hand counting votes is the only method with a higher error rate than those now famous hanging chads in Florida. Brian says it must be nice, in reference to Tina Peters, to have the money to throw around on wasted recounts. $256,000 of other people's money. Poof, for nothing. See you next time.